our um, last speaker. Um, interestingly, uh, Katya has paired us together in the morning at the beginning and the end, like the Alpha and the Omega. And it turns out, although it was, uh, uh, it was quite a meaningful coincidence that we um, have a lot in common in terms of our interests. Um, well, Charles's main focus is in French. He's James um, Barrow, Professor of French at the University of Liverpool. And he's published widely on travel literature, Francophone, um, travel literature of the 20th century, colonial history, post colonial um, literature and history, um, and including. A, um, a book on Victor Segalen, Aesthetics of Diversity, and Travel in the 20th Century French and Francophone Cultures. Um, and the title of the keynote is Transcultural Memories of the Bang, the Mediterranean and Global Penal Heritage. <laughs> That's great. That, thanks ever so much, um, Stefan. It's, it's lovely to be the Omega to your Alpha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm de delighted to have been um, invited to speak at, at the conference, not least because I, I've been, for the past five years, up for the Research Council, I've, I've been running the Translating Cultures theme, and mm -hmm. Ottoman Cosmopolitanism was, was one of our networks, and one which I, I took a particular interest in it. It's, it's good to see how things are still, still moving on. Um, this is a paper about the traces of journeys long forgotten and about the ways in which the itineraries that these afterlives conceal intersect with other histories, other stories, and other narratives. It closes the workshop by placing Mediterranean port cities in several alternative frames, understanding them, and this picks up on some of Stefanos' points um, this morning, understanding them as nodes in much wider networks of mobility and memory. So the frameworks I'm thinking about are those of, of penal heritage, um, with deportation and transportation understood in more global contexts. And then more specifically, and I'll come on to this, those of North African prisoners deported or transported from Mediterranean port cities and drawn into wider convict flows across the 80 years that French Guyana, so in Caribbean we'll have a look in, that French Guyana operated as a banya or penal colony and the 30 that New Caledonia in Melanesia fulfilled a similar function. I want to start with a couple of fragments. First one here. This is a recent graphic novel on Louise Michel, so mm -hmm. echoes with the commune, um, The Red Virgin, by Mary and Brian Talbot. And it contains a section on its subject's banishment to the penal colony in New Caledonia following the commune in 1871. A striking half page, you can see it here, is devoted to the arrival in the colony in um, 1873 of a group of prisoners following a long and complex journey which began in Algiers. Their political deportees following the Kabyl rebellion launched under the leadership of Mohammed al Nakhrani in um, 1871, actually in the same month that the commune um, was um, launched, and with whom Michel and other communards would feel a certain affinity as a result of their shared exile as perceived enemies of the French state. These entangled journeys that you can see in the graphic novel here are further complicated by the outbreak in 1878 of a Kanak revolt in New Caledonia, led by um, the chief Atayi, brutally repressed, in part with assistance from some of the Algerian prisoners, 
but part of a wider logic of anti-colonial struggle. When the Communards returned to France in 1879 and 1880, the Kabyle rebels remained in the Pacific, many staying on in New Caledonia until their deaths. The North African prisoners portrayed here by the Talbots were deportés, political prisoners, sent to New Caledonia for political reasons. But many civil cr um, criminals, known in French as transporté or relégué uh, recidivists, were also sent from North Africa to the penal colonies throughout the 80 years of their existence. So a second fragment, slightly um, earlier in terms of production, but later in terms of focus. This is an article from Alger Républicain from uh, 1938, where Albert Camus, then relatively early in his career, working as a journalist, describes the final con uh, con cargo of um, Algerian convicts as they embarked in the port city to travel um, west. East first, then west. Um, to be taken to the French Guyana, a penal colony whose um, abolition had by that stage already been confirmed. This text, you can see it here, entitled Ces hommes corps et l'humanité, these men expunged from humanity, presents the scene through the lens of the absurd that would shape, shape much of his subsequent work. The ship La Martinière arrives in Algiers from the Ile de Ré off the west coast of France. It was already carrying 609 recidivists en route to the French Guyana whom 57 Algerian prisoners would join. Camus refuses any sentimental response and is critical of the voyeurism of a group of elegant women on curiosity had brought there. He focuses on the conditions of incarceration on board ship, holding areas, punishment cells, mechanisms to control resistance, the deprivation of light, and underlines the dehumanization this implies. There is no spectacle, he says, more abject than seeing men dragged beneath the condition of humans. That reflection crystallizes in a vignette. Three North African prisoners looking out of a porthole onto the city of Algiers. For their comrades, he writes, it's a foreign land in a hitherto foreign world. But for them, it's still a little bit of themselves that they seek through the rain. The point of departure from the port city en route for the penal colony and the uncertainty, very real uncertainty, of return are drawn here into a reflection on belonging, on distinctive modes of engagement with place, and on the ephemeral narratives in which these are encapsulated. These traces of journeys surfacing in other contexts don't, of course, constitute travel literature. They belong instead to what James Clifford, in that important essay, Travelling Cultures, called the wide range of travel stories, not travel literature in the bourgeois sense, to which we must listen if those traditionally denied access to the means of narrating the travelogue um, are to be heard. In his argument, um, Clifford means contemporary migrant populations, but um, that's clearly extended, I think, to a range of other groups. What follows are some reflections um, that have emerged from a, a recently launched project, um, details are here, called Dark Tourism in Comparative Perspective. Um, and it's a project with colleagues in Paris and, and, and Tasmania. And as you'll see from what I've got to say, um, we're um, in Liverpool dealing with um, colleagues in Tasmania dealing with um, the strand around penal heritage and, and cultures of um, incarceration. My starting point um, is just to note that the status of the Banya or the penal colony in the post-colonial Francosphere is a highly contested one. Its meanings and memories are fragmented not just according to the scattered locations in which penal heritage sites are now located. Um, so we're talking about French Guyana, about um, New Caledonia. Um, there were also um, penal colonies in um, French Indochina. And as I'll say in a moment, there were the um, military 
um, been on colonies in BAD in North Africa too. So already there's this geographical fragmentation. Um, but also, this is what I want to talk about today, there's a fragmentation in the light of the multiple groups um, with which penal colonies have been and currently are associated. The history of imprisonment in the Banya is, is a very long one, combining metropolitan and colonial narratives. It's rooted in the practice, in evidence from at least the 15th century, of sending prisoners to the Mediterranean galleys. And that maritimization of punishment continued in the deployment of prison hulks, known as Banya Fiotons, floating penal colonies, used from the 18th century. These were progressively, although not entirely, replaced by the land-based Banya Metropolitan in French port cities, Brest and Rochefort, but particularly interesting for our purposes, um, Toulon. To understand how and where the Banya sits in contemporary post-colonial memory scapes, there's a need to see the institution as one of geographical marginalization. These places of incarceration and hard labor, originally situated in France or in um, the Mediterranean, were progressively displaced towards a colonial periphery. As co uh, penal colonies for adult criminals and political dissidents were, from the middle of the 19th century, located elsewhere, meaning that the port city, Bagne Metropolitain, and Rochefort and Brest were closed in the 1850s, and then the Mediterranean um, port city, Bagne of Toulon, which um, held a lot more prisons, um, ceased to function two decades later, in 1873. That shift away from metropolitan locations fulfilled multiple functions. It permitted location elsewhere, outside France, and indeed its colonies, of those considered socially or politically undesirable. It contributed to the active attempts at colonization and settlement of overseas colonies, otherwise often seen as unattractive to free settlers. And it provided the workforce required to build, extend, and maintain the infrastructure underpinning such imperial expansion. At the same time, and this is what really interests me, colonization and incarceration find themselves entangled in the complex geographical afterlives of the penal colony, often triggering tensions between social and ethnic groups within individual colonies, but also creating axes between colonized spaces across the globe. And the case of North African prisoners and their descendants is, as I hope to show, an underexplored but rather telling example of this. Very different from the convict sites in Australia, you can see um, the uh, 11 of them here, whose inscription by UNESCO on the World Heritage List in 2010 firmly drew narratives of transportation and forced labor into Australia, the national um, memory discourses whilst ensuring active integration of the tourist industry too. Very different from that, the ruins of the Banya in former French colonies, most notably in um, French Guyana that you see here, and also in New Caledonia as part of the, the itinéraire du Banya around the capital in Numea, they did not lend themselves to any such form of consensus or exploitation. Indeed, I'd argue that they continue to evolve as sites and encapsulate various strands of post-colonial conflict and contestation. The French operated systems of political exile and punishment in North Africa and indeed in French Guyana um, from the revolutionary period onwards. But it wasn't until the beginning of the Second Empire that Louis-Napoleon Louis Bonaparte sought by a decree in May 1854 formally to establish the penal colony um, in Cayenne, so in French Guyana, and at the same time to underpin condemnation to forced labor with the principle of what the French then called double peine or doublage. You serve your sentence, it's under seven years, then you serve the same period again, and then you have the right to return to metropolitan France. If your sentence is more than seven years, you then you're never going to go back. <laughs> the Guyanese penal colony rapidly achieved a reputation for the atrocious conditions 
it imposed on prisoners as well as those suffered by its guards and administrators. As a result of high mortality rates, transportation there was suspended in 1867, with prisoners sent to the supposedly less harsh conditions of New Caledonia um, for a relatively short period, so between 1863 and 1897. And but one point I'd make is it's really important to note that even for New Caledonia, where we're talking about a period of, of um, uh, operation that had been going for three decades, um, despite efforts to expunge its penal past, that the lived presence of um, the Banya persisted not just in the built environment, but also in the presence of those who had been incarcerated and refused to die. This is um, the, uh, Ahmed Ben Kadur, um, who arrived from Algiers in 1896 and died in 1968. So he actually had 72 years um, in, um, as, um, as, as convict and then as a free, um, free man in um, New Caledonia. Transporté, so um, <coughs> the um, civil prisoners from the French colonies, especially Algerian convicts, continued nevertheless to be sent to French Guyana um, throughout the period, um, and after 1887, French prisoners again, with sentences longer than eight years, are sent to um, the Caribbean, um, and then alongside another category of convict I've already mentioned, the, the relégué or recidivist, often guilty of um, relatively relative minor crimes, but having stacked up a number of them. Um, and this issue of categorization is, is absolutely crucial. And I, I think in a relatively short paper, it's sometimes difficult to un unpick this. I'm not just talking about the difference between um, the um, deporté um, or political prisoner, the transporté or civil prisoner, and the relégué or recidivist, but also um, for an individual prisoner within a single one of those categories, the status shifts. And you can see that here, this prisoner here, Saeed um, Ben Tuni, uh, who goes from being um, a um, a convict to um, a, uh, a free man with right to residence to somebody in the final categorization, um, the second phase of liberation, who is free if he wishes to, and he can afford to, um, to, 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 to leave um, the colony. French Guyana, as I've said, continued to serve as a penal colony well into the 20th century, um, and among those it received were prisoners from elsewhere in the French Caribbean, also political activists from um, Indochina um, who were sent to Guyana in the interwar period. Um, and just so you've got a sense of the history, in French Guyana, um, transportation was abolished in 1938, relegation um, in, for recidivists in 1945. The last group of convicts um, returned from French Guyana um, in 1953. Now, my, my interest in some other current work is on the relationship between the imagination of the penal colony um, generated in a very rich corpus of memoirs and travelogues and the tourist and heritage practices with which these are um, associated. I've been looking in particular at um, travel narratives that were brought out into the interwar period um, where there is sustained interest um, in specifically in French um, Guyana particularly important text was Albert Londres, I think 1923, Albert Londres, a reportage called Ur Bahania, um, which is uh, an expose of the, the way in which the conditions of the Bahania lead to a dehumanization of the um, convict population. So he says, um, for, for those visiting um, the site from a distance, it's magnificent. It's not true of a number of dark heritage locations. Um, uh, as you do, um, it's delightful to the eye, but the prison system upsets the natural um, order of things um, according to this schema evoked by an interlocutor. So the world's made of three things, the sky, the earth, and the people, colony. What's really interesting about um, this text is that from, from the first page, um, Londres reveals the complexity of the institution. Um, he's interested, for example, in the way in which the vessel that lands the convicts previously served the Algiers Marseille line and now provides transportation between French Guyana um, and Trinidad. So he's thinking already um, in, in, 
this text about a fairly transcolonial uh, context, which is very much part of um, what I want to talk about. Um, but the role of the prison in the colonial system is, is far from evident. He sees it not a clearly defined, regulated, or predictable punishment machine. It's a machine designed to impose misfortune that works without a plan or really clear um, matrix. If you read Aubania, it's very similar to a number of other um, reportages produced by, by Longo. His method is that of eavesdropping and making the reader feel um, as though um, they are listening in to the stories of those Longo meets. And it's almost as if for him, um, ordering and systematizing would be tantamount to betrayal. So the reporter draws the reader in his wake on an incredible journey in this case into um, total chaos um, of the penal colony from which all logic is absent. Now, quite a lot's been written on this text. What hasn't been teased out fully, and I'm not going to um, talk about these examples in, in great detail, is the way in which, despite the fact that Nandos style is flatly observational, um, there's a very subtle development of this, observa of this, this uh, acknowledgement of the transcolonial nature of the French penal colony. Um, his account repeatedly focuses on the presence of North African convicts um, in um, French Guyana. Sometimes the references are quite fleeting. Um, this one here, where, where you can see a convict who's, who, who, who's got a semi-official um, role um, looking after um, keys. Um, sometimes um, we get a, a vignette of an individual um, prisoner. This one here. Um, bullish um, Amar, um, driven mad by the climatic conditions, particularly by the sun, who, who spends who's, uh, in the morning throwing some stones um, at, at, the, at the, the sun. Um, another case, um, again, these little vignettes of, of, of individuals. Um, one who, uh, a, a prisoner here, um, uh, Mumi Benyami Ul um, Mahamad, um, who, it is clear, despite his deep frustration, is never going back to um, Algeria. And then that frustration at the end, um, um, what can you do when, um, when faced with the name of a, of, of, of a dead man? And at the same time, there's, there's a focus on the way in which, and it's really important for understanding um, forced labor in, in the penal colonies, um, there's almost a form of blended labor. So uh, this is a work party here with um, uh, prisoners from Indochina, uh, prisoners from sub Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, four from North Africa, and the rest um, white colleagues um, from France. Um, the final detail, I suppose, and this, the, the, this comes back to the, the idea of the port cities in nodes that interest me, um, is the, the, there's this fascination on the part of Long One, precisely the routes that convicts take to get to um, the, the people come. And here, here he talks about the vessel that comes from the Ile de Ré, it's on the west coast of France, it goes through Algiers, is following the route that, that Camus um, describes, and brings the um, convicts to um, Saint Laurent de Maroni, so the, the, the arrival station um, in, in French Guyana. Now, in the French public imagination, and this is evident already in the Camus text, that axis linking France to its penal colonies departed from, from the Ile de Ré, um, just off um, the, um, not really off, 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 off the west coast of France, around which there's this um, fascinating iconography related to the departure of the, the Bagnard. Um, Long, as I've said, alludes subtly to the more complex itineraries involved here suggesting a premature interest in what Claire Anderson has recently called a history of global mobilities from below, an approach that is disrupting any global north-centric understanding of migration by emphasizing the role of captivity, confinement, and restriction in histories of mobility as opposed to any a myth of freedom of movement. A major part of Anderson's argument rooted precisely in an attempt to write a global history of penal transportation, focuses on what I've been talking about already, the inter-imperial and circulatory nature of mobility, um, an aspect highly evident in French Guyana, characterized by those intersecting and often 
overlapping regimes of mobility, um, most notably enslavement, indenture, and convict labor, elements almost in a, in a continuum of unfree labor practices that underpin overseas European um, expansion. What strikes me, though, is, is that French penal colonies have customarily been associated with French metropolitan prisons. Um, both civil transporté, like Henri Charrière, known as Papillon, um, uh, celebrated through his novel, but more importantly through the magnificent film version of Stephen Queen and Dusty Hoffman, um, but also with political déporté, like the communard Louise Michel, I mentioned already, exiled, as I said, to New Caledonia in 1873. And of course, we can have Dreyfus um, sent to um, French Guyana in 1895. The incorporation of the stories of North African Magnard, uh, alongside those of prisoners from Senegal and Indochina, China, into more global histories of convict labor, challenges such ethnic homogenization and allows us to understand more clearly the multi-directional, trans-imperial complexity of convict flows. And just to add an extra dimension, I haven't got time to develop, but I think it's quite pertinent for um, our considerations today. Um, there's also this added presence of military penal colonies in, in Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. Most of them, perhaps for obvious reasons, to England, and there was one in Algiers, known as, as, as Biribi, established from 1818 onwards as, as penal battalions, associated with military convicts, as well as with, with um, civilian and political prisoners. And indeed, the, the success of Albert Londres' expose of French Guyana, or Bagne, I've just been talking about, um, led him to focus on these North African um, military um, penal colonies in this text. Um, Dalt, Levy, and Dante hadn't seen, any, hadn't seen anything. Um, I focus on these, these North African band here, where he finds conditions actually much worse than those he observed um, in French Guyana, and where the common refrain amongst those he meets, the incarcerated, is that they'd rather be sent to what was known as the Green Hell um, of, of French Guyana. Um, Londres conclusion in this text is that the institution is what he calls une grande honte pour la France, a great source of shame um, for France. So, and the Biribi belongs to the penal logic of situating places of incarceration away from metropolitan France, um, in part because the battalions um, they created were regularly deployed in other colonial situations. They also, though, coming back to my main focus, reveal the role of Algeria in France's carceral archipelago of sites of imprisonment and banishment. And that role is quite a shifting one. Um, unlike French Guyana and um, New Caledonia, Algeria didn't require extensive use of convict labor for the development of the colony. Um, but in 1848 and then in 1851, um, it served as a place of internment um, for many of those who opposed the restoration. And, um, Equally important, though, is the flow in the other way, and that is the Algerian political prisoners, I mentioned already, forced to leave the colony for um, New Caledonia, in addition to those many civil prisoners who ended up um, in, uh, doing hard labor in Guyana. Particularly prominent, as I've said, um, in the sorts of trans um, cultural memory that interests us are those rebels associated with the al Nukrani revolt in Kabylia in 1871. Um, recognition of the itineraries on which they were driven not only undermines, as I've suggested, many of these received ideas, the Papillon complex, uh, about penal transportation and deportation, but it also situates the Maghreb in alternative intercolonial networks that disrupt assumptions about the only important axes being the metropolitan ones linking North Africa to France. Establishing these sort of global histories of the Bagne and the Maghreb, or global histories in the Maghreb, involves two challenges that I'm going to explore in what remains of this paper. First is to do with the, the recovery of these often silenced travel stories from sparse archival traces and rare surviving narratives of the journeys they entailed. Secondly, um, is the identification of these histories 
in current memory practices, often but not exclusively beyond the Mediterranean, um, but very much rooted in the maritime journeys that began there. Um, those two examples that I began with, that recent graphic novel, the article by Camus from 1938, reveal the ways in which these histories have a tendency to resurface unexpectedly. Um, but it's the work of the, the writer and um, director um, Mehdi uh, Lalawi, an um, Algerian uh, writer director, that's produced a, a contrasting example of the possibilities of a more sustained effort to recover these narratives and therefore complexity. So in, in this book, it also, um, there's a documentary of the same title, um, he explores the geographical and historical displacements encapsulated um, in this idea of Camille um, du Pacifique, namely the circuitous journeys that led a minority group from Algeria to political exile in Melanesia. Now, Lamy's approach um, combines travelogue, archival quest, and the sorts of entangled historiography to which I've already alluded. He provides an account of what he calls um, puzzle whose pieces are um, disseminated around the whole world. Um, namely, the ways in which, through the intersecting itineraries of penal transportation, the Algerian Revolt of 1871 becomes enmeshed in the French Commune of the same year, and subsequently the Kanak Rebellion of 1878. The Algerian insurrection in Kabylia, a response to prolonged famine and the extension of colonial governance, was brutally suppressed and led to a trial of the surviving leaders in Constantine in 1873. Condemned to political exile in the French penal colonies, the rebels found themselves subject to um, long and convoluted um, journeys. Um, usually, they would, they would, the, the, the convicts to New Caledonia would stop off um, in Brazil and then cross um, this way. Um, but there was an, out, uh, an outbreak um, of, of disease, and it was a very, very long journey right around the Cape, stopping off at Reunion Island and, and uh, right around to the mayor. They were initially held, though, in Toulon, um, where their paths crossed with those of the communards still awaiting um, deportation. It's interesting that we actually owe to the communards some of the few remaining accounts of the experience of, of the Kabyle um, rebels. Then they were transferred to Brest, where after a prolonged period of uncertainty about their fate and in what were rapidly deteriorating conditions, ships took them 1874, 1875 on this five-month um, journey to um, New Caledonia. A number of prisoners um, were considered, this is a big issue um, in classification of colonial prisoners, some were seen as uh, civilian and not political, um, in an attempt to, 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 to downplay um, the, their resistance. Um, some were sent to Corsica as well. Lely Seba writes a beautiful short story in a collection of 18 of the week called Lisa on the, the Kabyle rebels who, who, who went up in, in Corsica. Those who go to New Caledonia, though, on arrival in Melanesia, um, the itineraries of the Algerian rebels and the communards converged as they shared the penal space of the Ile des Pins as they constructed their own accommodation, and they set about ways of, of surviving in this new um, environment. And just as an aside, that, that convergence and entanglement um, is evident in a number of the rather multi-layered lieux de mémoire that remain on that island, such as the, the cemetery of the de, um, deported, which is primarily associated with, with the communards um, who uh, raised a surprise subscription money for um, this monument to those who died whilst in New Caledonia. But it's also increasing, I haven't got time to talk about it in detail, but this is a plaque from 2014. And because that cemetery contains um, the remains of, of a number of the Kabyle rebels, it's being drawn now into Algerian memory work as well. The majority of the um, communards were, as I've said, amnesty, permitted to return to France, 1879-1880. But a number of them campaigned unsuccessfully for their amnesty to be extended to the Algerian rebels. By 1895, several of the Kabyle rebels had died, several had escaped, 
And it's in that year that a number are returned to Algeria, where their daily lives continue to be very close to the police. The remainder, you can see some of them here, this is from the mid-1890s, stayed in New Caledonia, where they formed the basis of the community of Algerian heritage, it still exists in the country, in the town of Bourai, which is in the north of the south province, um, responsible not least for the introduction of the cultivation of date palms. Lalawi's book and film are part of a, a sustained travail de me memory work, essential to Algerian, French, and Canadian history. Um, the narratives that Lalawi recounts are, I'd suggest, almost experimental travel logs in which itineraries are reconstructed from fragments, the processes of, whom, of whose assemblage um, are reflected in their very form. Lalawi's narrative voice provides a frame for the accounts that emerge. These are implicitly, as his search for traces of Algerian prisoners in contemporary New Caledonia makes clear, a narration of his own journeys. But the book is primarily a collage of other texts, archival and printed, many of which already belong to the wider category of travel writing. Um, once it's extended to include ships, logs, personal diaries, correspondence produced by those on the move, um, even this is a very rare photograph from the 1870s of the Balanya itself. What's striking though is that within this accumulation of fragments, um, Algerian voices are rare. Uh, there's an 1874 letter from Mohamed Ben Abed Kassem, then incarcerated in the West, requesting pardon. There's another from this man here, as is Ben Shekel Hadid, um, who fled the conditions of resistance in New Caledonia in 1881, describes a stay in Sydney on route for Cairo, and then Jeddah, from where 15 years later he's still hanging around petitioning, um, as far as we can tell unsuccessfully a return to Algeria. Lalawi's reconstruction of these travel stories, to borrow again Clifford's term, is at the same time a performance of his own ultimate, of its own ultimate impossibility. His is a subtle work of deconstruction, seeking traces in ship's logs, in the writings of communards, in the diaries and letters of naval surgeons and colonial officials. And the outcome is a text whose fragmentary nature reveals the persistent absence of detail from the itineraries he evokes, but fails to capture. It's striking that Lalawi, a celebrated writer and film director, remains rooted in the archive and the physical spaces of travel, and doesn't subject his inquiry to a fictional or um, imaginary detour. In seeking to recover and rewrite the travel stories of North African convicts um, elsewhere, in in this case, in, in um, French Guyana. Another contemporary Algerian novelist has adopted the fictional approach. This is a text of um, Cayenne Montpombo by uh, Mourad uh, Mouroud Akshouche, which describes a contemporary French protagonist of Algerian origin, a um, figure called Richard uh, Benoussif, who, following the death of his father, decides to travel to French Guyana to discover his own father's convict past. So it, 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 it's a it's a novel that, that com combines three locations, France, Algeria, French Guyana, and it juxtaposes two moments of narration, the narrative present, 1998, and the period of the father's own incarceration between um, 1927 and um, 1951. The novel recounts multiple journeys, those of Mohamed himself, soldier of the French colonial army, condemned to hard labor following the killing of two men in a fight in a bar, who then returns to Algeria and then resettles in France following the abolition of the Bani. And then those of his son, Richard, first to Algeria to bury his father, and then to Guyana, where he seeks to understand his own relationship to France and French history, um, as much as to find traces of his own father's period of incarceration. Actus um, provides a detailed <coughs> Uh, account of Mohamed's deportation on board the ship La Martinière, um, whose departure from Algiers Camus himself described in 1938. The novel outlined his arrival in the alien environment of Guyana and his absorption into the carceral universe that this entails. 
it captures the everyday um, brutality of the place, the uneasy implementation of the reforms through which it was passing, and the relationships between the multiple ethnic groups in the colony. Lowell focuses also on the period following Mohamed's sentence for his return to Algeria under that practice of doublage I've mentioned. The son's return to the penal colony is later, during which he discovers the existence of a half-sister, provides a, shade, a frame for his reflection on his own uneasy relationship with both French and Algerian cultures, and suggests parallels between the structures of incarceration in French Guyana and those in the banlieue in contemporary France. It's however not the work's documentary value that's of importance. That's of importance. It's evident that the novelist has drawn on some of the numerous sources available on the Banya in the period in question. What's striking, though, and even disruptive, is the way in which Cayenne Montombu takes the multiple itineraries it describes to challenge the traditional trans-Mediterranean focus of many Algerian novels and to plot these alternative transcolonial, in this case, transatlantic axes. This is a multi-directional work linking colonialism, penal servitude, and debates regarding contemporary identity. It's a fiction that contributes to the writing of a more global history of conflict labor and transportation, and challenges received wisdom about sites such as French Guyana and, by extension, New Caledonia, persistent in the popular imagination and often replicated in heritage practices. In conclusion, I'd like to ask, what are the implications of these entangled histories, these complex inter- and intra-colonial transportation flows and multi-directional memories, as well as the multi-layered sites to which they give rise? Akush, um, in this text, describes Mohamed's arrival from Algiers at Saint-Laurent-Humaroni in French Guyana in the 1920s, and also his son's return there as a tourist of memory in the 1980s. That key site in the Guyanese penal colony, for which a new museum was opened in 2014, is central to the final text, and um, like the final, I'm going to finish in, in, in the Caribbean with a Caribbean author, Guyane Trasmémoire, a photo essay by Patrick Chamoiseau and Robert Amadi, um, centered around a reflection on how the penal site is not necessarily best approached as a place of colonial memory, as a lieu of mémoire, but is arguably better defined according to post-colonial memory traces, or what they call um, trace uh, mémoire, by which the present continues to be linked to the past in the Americas, and at which entangled memories and converging itineraries are present. The book is based on a critique of the memorial landscape of the territory, the ethnicized dimensions of which are accentuated in much official memorialization. The result is, um, as um, Shamozo writes, that um, nearly finished. these buildings don't reflect other people, Native Americans, African slaves, Hindu immigrants, uh, Syrian Lebanese, Chinese, we get out of North African um, colonies, who rushed into these colonial lands, first had to find a way to survive, then to live together until they produced a cultural entity and an original identity. The goal of Shamrazo's project is to underline the diversity of origins and experiences that that singularizing term, Banya, Convict tends to obscure. So what Shamazo refers to, and to give you a sense of the book, it's, it's a photo essay, um, images of the Banya in a state of, of, of ruination, juxtaposed with texts from, um, from, from Shamazo. He refers to the, these dozens of books, chronicles, testimonies, articles about the Banya, but focuses instead on an attempt to perceive what the memory traces um, whisper to us. The photographs on which the essayist comments indirectly are presented in the context of a new digressive approach. Um, here I am, he says, in these memory traces of the banya, um, uh, not visiting, but wandering, not dawdling, but straying. And at the end of his account, um, he talks about moving away from these places, um, heritage, tourism, professionals, because conservation will become Poetics. Um, uh, um, curators will belong to the brood of poets. Now, far from being a poetics of destructive entropy, what Shamroza is pro 
opposing here, I think, is a rejection of any transformation of the site into a straightforward dark tourism destination, into a site of Republican memory, into a site of saccharine heritage, um, or a monument with, with guided trails. He said, I cannot and do not want to tell you how to um, uh, go about your visit, nor designate the way in, or worse, establish a carefully measured report on the um, walls and spaces. Chenzo doesn't then go on to impose his own story, but advocates instead the excavation or imagination of other travel stories or life histories. That is the integration, as with Malawi's work on New Caledonia in the later 19th century, as with Akushi's on Guyana in the 20th, of what he calls dominated um, stories, overwritten memories. The travail de mémoire emerging not in Guyana, but in New Caledonia, in the communities of Algerian heritage, but also across different community groups, provides increasing evidence, I think, of um, the transcultural memories um, emerging around questions of loss and gain, particularly related to the Arabic languages, the particularities of Kabir culture, questions of uprooting and rerouting. The Algerian cemetery at Bourai, um, now complemented by a um, cultural centre, complemented um, by various um, trappings of, um, of, 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 of memory work, has become a key um, you know, memoir, a site of memory um, in New Caledonia. The recent um, exhibition at the um, Institut du Monde Arabe called Caledonia um, has generated a visibility um, for North African heritage in a memory state otherwise dominated by the stories of white French convicts. So I think that there's a dynamic community association in Bourai where the cemetery is. Delegates have recently returned to Algeria, reversing the 19th century journeys of their ancestors. So traces of these convict voyages emanating from those nodes of the Mediterranean port cities that interest us today reflect, I think, the ways in which penal heritage relates equally um, to these transcultural memories too often obscure.